Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. This is the Bet Online Salute Detroit podcast. We are live on a Sunday morning recap. Victory first, Sunday. Victory Sunday recap. And the first thing I'm going to say is 668 yards. That's where we're going to start with 668 yards to 360. And two of those yards was on big plays. Like I always say, you keep them under 100 yards rushing and you keep them under 200 yards passing, you got a chance. And that's what we saw yesterday when USC Trojans played the Nevada Wolfpack. I'm with your guy, Ryan Dyrude. How are you doing today, Ryan? What's up, my man? Good. It's a victory Sunday for the Trojans. It's the last Sunday without NFL football. Um, we got Labor Day tomorrow. It's a little cooler temperatures, so life is good. Cannot complain. I thought it was a great win yesterday. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, not a superior opponent by any means, but hey, it, we talked to Mario Williams afterwards. Says, hey, we treat every game the same. Uh, we don't see them as an inferior opponent, and I think they certainly proved that on Saturday night with how they played. Yeah, definitely. And and uh, us talking to Jamal yesterday after he after he, uh after he pretty much ripped me and I had explained to him what I meant by a statement game. And I, I think he understands now, like they had to come out and do this, right? This was the statement that they had to make. Like they had to come out and show that they are a superior opponent to teams like this. And they are somebody to be reckoned with and watching all the talking heads on all the college football pregame shows. Mine is Disney because I get, I got cut off from <laughs> Disney because of my cable network. But a lot of people have USC going to the college football playoff, and this is something that they had to do to do this. I yep. will say this. The defense made a statement yesterday, right? And I'm we're going to exclude that touchdown what, late in the third quarter. Um, I mean, it is what it is. It's the JV team. I was a youngster. They got one. They got one on us, and it's fine. But when the varsity team was in, when the starters were in, offense was pretty much – a premium like you just could not they nevada could not function they had that one good drive and after that they turned it on they got going and that's the type of things that you have to see right and that's how you answer the questions about how good is sc really and so those are those those are the things that you have to worry about and those are the things that you have to answer so um i'm i'm extremely impressed with the defense i'm extremely i will say this so everybody was talking about sherrod sanders oh this and that well, Caleb Williams had an ultimate, ultimate hold my beer moment. Four touchdowns in the first half, 258 yeah. yards, five touchdowns. Uh, let's see, I'm looking at it, 319 yards. I don't think the world's ready for him. I don't think the world's it's ready wild, for him. Dude. It's wild, dude. It's wild. I will say this, and we'll talk about it more tomorrow, and I'll give you a little teaser. Caleb Williams has the hardest task this year than anybody in college football. Just keep that in mind that his task is going to be harder than anybody in college football because he's trying to accomplish something that only one person has accomplished in the history of college football. So he has the hardest task and the weight of the world is on his shoulders right now. But mm-hmm. we'll get in that tomorrow. So <clears throat> the one I thing I say, we'll get ahead. we'll get in. We'll get in. Yeah, because today's live show, we're going to talk a little more youngsters and tomorrow mm-hmm. we'll do a full. Uh, deep dive breakdown um, once we can kind of watch the film a little more and stuff. But I thought it was, I thought this was good coaching, but also just shows the level up from like the take nothing away from Miller Moss who came in and played well. We all love Miller Moss, but just shows the level of difference between Caleb and, and Miller. You know, I, Miller was going to, you could tell after that last touchdown in the second half, when, when Caleb came out in the early in the third quarter, it's like, okay, his night's done. He's got his fifth touchdown. So he got his Heisman stamp there. He's good. And then Nevada pins him on the one yard line. So it looked like Miller was going to go in and they're like, oh, let's trot Caleb out, get a first down, get him out of the, the depths, the end zone. And then we'll make the switch. So Caleb got the first down and then Miller came in. So I just thought that was kind of like, all right, let's not put the, put the backup in a terrible situation here on the one yard line. We'll let our, our best player in the world go out and and show him how it's done. So I just thought that was kind of a funny note. Yeah, that was, I will say this. uh, I will say this. They were spreading the ball around yesterday. A lot of people in the beginning got a lot of chances and, and and we, and we touched on this, right? Branch didn't, Branch didn't, uh, Branch didn't get a lot of touches yesterday, Mm -hmm. but that's okay. And then we talked about that. Only one, only one. Right. Yeah. And we, it, it was a touchdown. It was early in the mm-hmm. game, but I guarantee you he's still happy, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's one of those things that happen. I guarantee you he's still happy. Well, so, it shows 
what shows out right. the just the absolute depth of this receiving unit and even the running backs. I mean, the the most receptions was Mario Williams with four. Mm-hmm. He led he led the entire room with four receptions. There was what twelve guys that had catches yesterday. There were fourteen receivers that had catches. Twenty five catches, four hundred and fifty three yards total. Fourteen, yeah, insane. And in rushing, you had six rushers. So, yep. yeah, it, you know, they're definitely Lincoln's definitely using these games to, uh, you know, we we said we wanted to see it more controlled and just like do what you're good at, but he's definitely using it to like we're gonna we're gonna spread it around and see what we really have heading into Pac-12 play. Yeah, one hundred percent. And we'll we'll like I said, like we said, we'll take a deeper dive in that tomorrow. What I want to talk about today is the future is bright in Troy. The future yeah, is bright in Troy. There's a whole bunch of depth when you get okay so let's start here i think about five years ago they approved this rule that you get four games or maybe it was proposed and maybe it was approved it was approved three years ago you get four yeah, games right after covid is that when they approved it i think when so because covid like everyone got the free covid year and then they adjusted the red shirt rule during that time too i think so around yeah the same so it, it was proposed i think i so it was proposed, I think, 2016 or 2017. My wife actually would know because she worked in compliance and she was a she knew that rule was coming and they were mm-hmm. talking about it and they actually voted on it. Like because so the way rules are are voted on in the NCAA, it starts with the student athletic council. It goes mm-hmm. from the student athletic council to the ADs. It goes from the ADs, and then when it finally reaches the presidents, the presidents vote. And that's how it gets approved. So this went through the sack and um, they actually had a chance to vote on it. So I knew this rule was coming a long time ago, but the rule, okay, neither, neither here nor there, the rule came through. So the four games that you get to play and then they say, hey, we're going to redshirt you. That's perfect because here's a good example. I think Makai Lim is going to get redshirt and that's okay mm-hmm. because guess what? He already has a touchdown. He has two catches. He has 59 yards in his career. Right. Mm -hmm. That's just from that game. Right. He's going to be good. He's just not ready yet. And we and we saw that yesterday. Like, oh, there's a bunch of upside to this kid. It's just he's just not there yet. And that's okay, Michael. I want to just just to jump in real quick. Sorry, I'll do this a lot. Just cut you off. But jump in with Makai. Like he looks honestly great for a freshman. It's just hard because he's in the same class as Zachariah Branch. So he's in an (laughs) all world same class as him, but Makai's looked great for a freshman. He had a great fall camp. He was a little banged up early on in, in the spring, and he's come back and battled back. So the future is very bright with Makai, and he showed it yesterday when when he got the playing time in the second half. So, so yeah, I just wanted to add that. No, that 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 you're 100 percent right. The guy who's going to be a freak, the guy who's going to be a freak. I don't. Uh, 89. What's his first name? Um, he's oh, a freshman uh, as well. Lane. Yeah. Lane, yeah. Lane, yeah. Lane, Lane is gonna be a freak. Did have you seen his hands? They showed his hands on TV. His hands are this big, dude. Let me see if I can <laughs> his hands are this big. Yeah. It's basically <laughs> his catching hands, a nerf ball. Yeah, like his hands are super big. He's he's a big body. He's just not there weight wise yet. But guess what? Yesterday he had one catch for eleven yards. That's all he needs, right? He get a, he mm-hmm. gets an opportunity to do it next week. <clears throat> there may, I should say this, there may be an opportunity for him to do it next week, depending on the score with uh with Stanford. But these dudes are getting experience. McCree, oh, uh, that's the tight end. Sorry. Quinn Joyner got a got a uh got some burn. He's a freshman. Freshman uh, back, yep. Yep. Um Quinn and Joyner was all, also broke one loose, right? That's what he yeah. ran what so. Uh, Barlow, they, Barlow's from TCU, right? But he's also young, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you can't be. Yeah, they, I mean, he's he's been there now a little while, but um, I think he still has maybe another year of eligibility, right? So, and I'm still high on Miller Moss. Miller Moss isn't going to be Caleb Williams, and I understand that, but Miller Moss will be great in his own way. So, it's like Matt Carson and Matt Carson and Matt are two different quarterbacks. They're in the same system, but they were great in their own way, right? Mm-hmm. I think Miller Moss is going to be really good, right? Depending on what Caleb does, but Miller Moss was 7 for 10. He had 134 yards. He had a touchdown. This is his second touch. Miller Moss has two touchdowns on the season, and he's the backup yeah. quarterback. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's a. I, I I will say this: the one thing I'm kind of disappointed about, in decision wise, that they didn't put Malachi Nelson in. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I don't know the reason like, behind it. Go ahead. It's it seemed almost like it's just because, like Miller Moss got in. I think not so late, but like by the time he was in, he'd only had like two drives, and so it's like, all right, do they want to take him out and give Malachi one or two? which I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it seemed like they wanted to just, you know, let's let Miller just finish this game. He's only had two opportunities. They're moving the ball. Um, we know we're probably going to redshirt Malachi anyway. Like, yes, reps are important, but, you know, Miller, if anything, God forbid, happens, like Miller's got to be ready. So we need to give him more reps at this point in the season, probably. That's, if I'm guessing, would have been a good question to ask, actually. I should have asked that. <clears throat> yeah, that would, uh, that, yeah. I said the one I wanted you to ask. <laughs> 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 no, but it's, it, how do you how do you put it? Um, there's more. There, you're right. This is what I was going to tell you. The offense is different. The offense is different when Miller Moss is in than when Caleb is in. And when I say it's different, I'm not talking about oh well, it's Caleb and Miller Moss. The play calling is different. If you notice, mm-hmm. Caleb Caleb is more of a shot taker. Which Miller Moss took a shot yesterday. I'm not going to take that away from him, but. Mm-hmm. If you want to give a comparison, if you watched the Colorado game yesterday, Miller Moss's offense turns to that. It's more take what they give you and let's work yeah. downfield, and you get a lot more read options to where Caleb is more progressive routes downfield and bigger shots. Hundred percent. You know, what that's I mean? what I was gonna say. Miller, it's 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 a quicker make your read and get rid of it. Make your read and get rid of it. It's a lot of dump offs, taking the shot, but it's on that first read. Whereas Caleb sits back there for twenty five seconds and just makes magic happen. <laughs> Make magic happen. Yeah, one hundred percent. So. I, that's why I said Miller will be special in his own way because we're going to see a different offense with Miller Moss, but we're going to see a bunch of stars still. We still got Michael Jackson, right? We got Lane. We got Quinn Joyner, uh, Makai Lemon, Todd's Washington, right? Todd's Taj, is going to be – this is what category I put Todd's Washington in. I put him in the category with – uh, uh, Kerry Covert, Steve Smith, Taj Washington mm. is in that category, right? Love it. He he may not be the star, but he will be a star, and he's going to be a key factor to each victory each week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, and he'll he'll be probably a mid round draft pick next year, just because he does he does all the little. He's like a he's almost honestly like this is this is high praise, and I know people hate when you you need comp to NFL players, but he kind of reminds me a little bit of Cooper cup. Like he's a tremendous blocker. He's a little Mm -hmm. undersized. He's got elusive speed. Like he's not a burner, but Hey, he's had the two longest like touchdowns on the year from Caleb so far in two games. Um, He does all the little things in the weight room, all the little things in the practice field, his players, like literally, um, who was it last night saying they would like the entire locker room would run through a wall for Tosh Washington. And when you said that about a receiver, that's high praise because those are usually the prima donnas and not Tosh Washington. So kind of Cooper cup esque and just the ultimate team guy that can do it all. But honestly is the probably most underrated receiver in that room that doesn't quite get the shine that the likes of Dorian singer and Zachary branch are getting. Um, but in reality, he's, he's leading the room in touchdowns if I'm not mistaken. Well, he had two yesterday. I don't know. I'll have to go back and look at season. And total. he had one in one in week one. So he's got three total, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then he had a here's a here's an interesting stat. He had a hundred percent completed uh percentage yesterday. So every time he got the ball thrown to him, he caught it. And there, yep. I'm assuming they were both for touchdowns. Forty five yards was his longest. He's averaged twenty five <laughs> yards, right? So that reminds me because I played with Steve, right? And that reminds me like he reminds me so much of Steve because we had one year we had Dwayne Jarrett. And we had all these um, all these big-time receivers. But then Dwayne Jarrett, Paxton Turner, Fred Davis, right? But then Steve Smith was the one that always made the big play. And I and I kind of mm-hmm. get it from a coaching aspect because you're like, we have to worry about Dwayne. We have to worry about Dwayne. We have to worry about this and that. And he's like, oh, we don't have enough. We don't have enough to cover everybody, right? So Taj is the guy that gets missed. And you can't always miss him because when you miss him, he's going to make big plays. So that's why I, I – I feel like he's going to be one of those. Like, I, I hope he stays for four because he could break some records. That's why I put him in that category with Steve Smith and Kerry Covert. Yeah. So well, he's a he, he's a redshirt senior, so this will be his last year. He'll be he'll be going to the, oh, the okay. show next year. Um, 
but yeah, he'll, he's, he's integral to the success of this year, which is crazy to say, considering how much depth they have, but I just think he does so much for the offense that maybe the, the naked eye doesn't even see like, yeah, three for 75 and two tubs yesterday is great. But in the blocking game, he's, he's one of the best then not just USC, but one of the best in the PAC 12 and even the nation. So um, yeah, I love, love me some Tosh Washington. He's become a real leader on this team too. I mean, he's been in multiple press conferences and usually that means, you know, they're a vocal leader as well. And he's a good is, cook. Chef Tosh, uh, baby. Yeah. Is he a Helton guy? Is, was he recruited by Helton? He transferred over uh, during From Memphis final year. Yeah. From Memphis. So right? he, yeah. So okay. he transferred in his last year. Uh, and then that uh, he's been obviously, so it's, this is his third year in the, in the program. Okay. And then Hudson, Hudson, uh, Kyron Hudson, Hudson finally got some shine. I talked yeah. about him. Remember in the preview, like he, yeah. you know, got out there, made a nice catch over the middle and in, in traffic. So, um, yeah, they got, I mean, I'm, I'm probably drawing a blank. I'm sure someone in the chat or someone can correct me, but I feel like almost every single receiver was involved at one point, at least with uh. one catch. From what I'm looking at at the stats, I think every receiver got a catch that we know. That's even even uh, McCree had a big play, right? Yeah, McCree had the big play, and he yeah. his was and, for ten yards. So, and just to say this, because I I hopefully we'll learn more on Tuesday, but Relik Brown did not dress, so I don't know if that's going to be a red shirt situation or a transfer situation or something else going on. Um, um, so we'll ask on on Tuesday, I'm sure at practice, ask Coach Riley. If there's an update there, but so of the receivers, it did not. He's was one of them that did not get any play, but he didn't play at all. So was he at the game at all? I didn't see him. I don't want to confirm that he wasn't, but I did not see him at all. No. Okay. That that's, that's where he, because Mason Cobb and um, I can't think of the tall dude's name right now. It's, Eric Gentry. So we got Eric. an update on them. Uh, it is injury related for both of them, at least according to coach Riley. So Gentry just wasn't quite ready yet to go, you know, coming off his injury from last season. Um, he's made, been making progress. Uh, and then Cobb must, he like he didn't say what, but must have tweaked something. Cause he said, yeah, he just wasn't, it wasn't ready. Um, we didn't want to push him, you know, so maybe he, that's a cover for something, but based on that, it was injury related, but nothing serious. They basically said, you know, we're just holding it day by day, but, um, he said, regardless of the opponent, neither would have played. So I guess it's a, a big enough injury to where it wasn't based on the opponent. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure if they were playing Utah or something, they they probably would have suited up because they only had three. They only had in, three inside backers on the on the game day roster, and then you lose Tackett Curtis, and you're you're playing two the rest of the game basically. Right, shuffling. Right, which so, we had. Yeah. Which which Shane Lee showed up. He had ten tackles. You know, I I know he doesn't quite fit this scheme it's just a fact but i just i love shane lee he's just a good dude he's a great leader and he just he, he doesn't complain like he basically is a captain and lost his starting job to a freshman and he's still when he's out there he's out there and he plays as hard as he can so i love shane lee for that you know obviously you got to have the best player out there especially when you're contending for a natty but at least he's you know he's a good locker room guy right and so <clears throat> the part i was watching yesterday that actually made a lot of sense to me those youngsters on the defense are better than people think. Yes. Those youngsters on the defense that played the third and fourth quarter are a lot better than people think. Did Roland, Roland Shelby? Go ahead. Yep. Real quick. So Roland, yeah. Roland Wallace is what, 6'3? Sounds right. Let me confirm that. He's 6'3 and he's a corner. But he looks like he's, you could, at his body frame, he still looks like a high schooler. When he gets muscle on him and he gets faster, he's a potential first round draft pick. This is yeah. this, this is what was on the field yesterday. Like, you know what I mean? Go ahead. What were you gonna say about Shelby? Well, for since you brought up Christian Roland Wallace, just wanted to because he had to um, you know, redshirt senior, he had to miss the first half because of uh Pac 12 put like a suspension on him for something that happened last year when he was at Arizona. Mm. And so so Lincoln Riley actually, I've never, I haven't seen this since covering them, but he started his press conference as no, it was just him. And then that he addressed that situation and basically, I don't want to say blasted the Pac-12, but basically said, look, we were extremely disappointed. I'll post the video up here in a minute, but extremely disappointed of the um, Pac-12 decision. Like we didn't see anything that determined there needed to be a suspension or anything like that you know these are valuable playing times for guys trying to make it into the league and and so he basically was coming out just saying i don't want any of this to go against 
Roland Wallace's character or anything like that for getting suspended in a college game, like, cause it wasn't warranted at all. So he was just defending his guy. I thought it was kind of cool that, you know, he did that first before even talking about the game and, you know, cause I mean, these are, these are guys trying to make it a dance. You missed a half a football and you know, you know how scouts are. They paralysis by over analysis, right? They look at too right. much into things like, Oh, red flag suspended for a half for, for doing something in a game. And in reality is like, no, you talked to coach fish did all this stuff. It's like, I don't even see where the suspension was warranted. There wasn't even like a ejection in the game or anything. So um, yeah, well, I just wanted to mention that. I've been in that situation before actually coaching. We, we didn't, we didn't see that. We didn't see the actual hit during the game. And then we're watching the film and we get an email from the officiate, the, from the, the conference office and from the official saying that, he was actually a corner too. Like one of our corners was suspended, and we're like, "What?" Like we're so they sent us the play number, and they ran a screen, and our corner ran through the guy blocking him, and um, pretty much made the tackle. And we were like, "This is crazy!" But they said he lowered his head. We appealed it. We couldn't get the appeal. So that happens more often than you think. Like it's kind of weird. The targeting thing is getting a little obsessive, and mm-hmm. I think. I think the problem is they don't have football people making those rules, right? They're trying to be safe and make the game safe, but they're not They're You can't talk to you. Here's, here's what I always say about targeting. Show me a way, show me a way that I can make a tackle without using my head, right? There are ways I get it, the gator tackle and things like that. But if I'm running and you're running, show me a way to make a tackle without using my head. You get what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of things like that. So it's a, it's a little frustrating. Well, what's hard is like, yeah, yesterday's tacky curse. That was 100% by rule targeting. Like there was no question about it. What's hard with the rule is, is the ejection piece. Like it's just, it should be a penalty. Absolutely. We want to do anything you can to have the protection, but the ejection to me is just so, so frustrating when it's, it's just a bang, bang football play. Like there's some targeting you see out there that's maybe dirty and head hunting, but, 95% 95% of the time, it's probably just a football play that maybe, you know, freshman, mis- little poor position or this or that, like a mistake. I'm not saying it's like not no fault of his own, but ejection worthy. Like if that was a big time game, like that's just, I think if, think if we're playing Utah yesterday and all of a sudden we're down to two inside backers, our three Listen, starting yeah. backers all out. Uh, I mean, that's a huge call. Luckily it's, you know, it's Nevada. So it didn't, didn't really have any effect in reality. You get to see some of the other guys get some more playing time, but yeah. So that's that. But anyway, I want Braylon Sheldy, freshman, yeah. big dude. Uh, and, you know, th- this is a guy that's had a great spring camp, great fall camp. You know, he's he's going to get in that rotation, um, in in that edge rotation with, you know, the likes of Jamil Muhammad, Anthony Lucas, and those guys. But yesterday, three tackles, two TFLs, and a sack, and a forced fumble. I mean, you can't have a much better game than that. And he only played basically a quarter and a half. And his forced fumble was scooped up by old Stanley T, the big fella, Rumbled into the end zone. So, uh, yeah, hats off to the young freshman. Um, I thought he had one of the best games on defense of anyone and only played a quarter and a half. And he just is – he's continuing to cement his his self as he's going to really crack that starting rotation as the season progresses, which is great. It's another freshman that is having an impact. You know you know who I was happy to see play yesterday, and he got, a, he got in on a sack. And you're going to know his name. He's, he's number 99. He's been there forever. I think he's a registered senior. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Defense lineman, white dude. Oh, uh, yeah, Jack Sullivan. Jack Sullivan. Jack yeah. Sullivan was in the rotation yesterday, being being productive. So, and I like I like Jack Sullivan as a role player in the role that he that he's in now. You know what I mean? Like he's not a mm-hmm. starter, but he's going to make plays. And it and as long as and it seems like he's bought into that. And like I said, he was in on a sack and a half yesterday. So. I, yeah, I mean, he's Jack in the Sullivan. starting rotation. He plays it. Yeah, he's in that rotation. Yeah. So he it's plays great. A ton. Big Bear. Big Bear was great yesterday. The, the reason why you call him Bear, he was whooping that center's butt yesterday. So I was impressed with that. Overall, yeah. though, Ryan, overall, though, I <clears> – and we'll – like we said, we'll get into the crevice of the game tomorrow. I am so excited about what's coming, right? And then – What's coming because like everybody's so in- involved in the transfer portal, but they forget the fact that we are in a recruiting hotbed, right? It's California and Texas and Florida could figure out who's two and three, but we're in a recruiting hotbed. We have the number one and number two 
nationally ranked high school football teams in one state in the same league within 30 <laughs> miles from each other, right? Yeah. Within 30 miles from SC. <laughs> right. Within 30 miles from SC. Like recruiting, recruiting in California is just amazing. Like, here's the thing, and I I, I meant to start off with this. Oregon State has a chance to finish a Pac-12 sweep on opening weekend. Yeah. Right. And and Crazy. there's only there's only one school in the Pac-12 that played a one double A school. What other conference could say that? Every other conf every other school in the Pac-12 played a power five or a group six school. Yep. Oregon is the only one that played a one double A school, but that's just what they do. Like they can't handle big time games early in the season, but it is what it is. <laughs> we'll, we won't get into that. But the, Al the Alabama but, of the West. There you go. But like their group is they were playing group six or Utah beat Florida. So SEC doesn't yeah. have anything. We'll give Big Ten a pass because Nebraska played Minnesota and Northwestern played Rutgers today. So they kind of you automatically get two losses like that. So I yeah. guess in a way they they also have a sleep. But like playing hey, out of Colorado conference, Colorado beat Colorado beat TCU. Colorado beat TCU. So so uh, Roland Wallace is a senior since six Utah. He looks six three, like he looks long and good. Hopefully he gets a chance in the NFL. Um, Colorado beat TCU. So we beat a Big Twelve school. We beat a SEC school. Uh, we didn't play any Big Ten, so it is what it is. But we beat the SEC. You know how I feel about the SEC, so that's either here or yeah. there. But like, <clears throat> back to what I was saying, we have the number one and number two nationally ranked high school football team. People don't pay attention anymore to high school recruiting because they're so involved in the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this: Lincoln Riley does a transfer portal right. He fills his important spots with the transfer portal. But he's also recruiting hard in California, and recruiting has changed. Recruiting has changed since since I've since I have been playing college football. When I was playing college football, and I went to SC, recruiting recruiting was a regional thing. If you're on the West mm -hmm. Coast, more than likely you would go to a West Coast school. If you were in the Central, you know what I mean. Like recruiting yeah. now, recruiting is so national now. But SC doesn't have to go national. Because of what we have here in Cal in in the whole state, I'm not just going to say something in California. From from the north to the south, there's so much talent. East from the water to Vegas, like there's so much talent there. Like, yep. like you see what this team is going to be, and the excitement is going to the excitement that I have. Like, I'm just it's like the stock that's going to blow. Right now, I will tell you this: I don't know when the national championship is coming, and I will say this: like, oh, do I think S SC is a college football playoff team as of right now against a better school i don't know i need to see that right so we'll find out next week they're playing a power five school they're playing stanford which is a rivalry game and stanford is always tough so we'll get a good idea of what we're going to see when mm -hmm. they're going to win the national championship i don't know do they have the ability and do they have the ability and the tools to win a national championship yes they do it's all up to performance now do they have the ability to become the next alabama or right now, Georgia, who's on the way trying to work for a three-peat? Yes, they mm -hmm. do. It's just what they do and how they perform and if they're put in the best situation possible to win. But what they have waiting in the farm system at SC is going to blow you guys' mind. Yeah, I and mean, the farm is stacked, and I think that's the important <laughs> thing. I think we that was the biggest thing last year was, you know, I think – we said Lincoln Riley and the, and the whole program was ahead of schedule with how it performed last year, but you could see the lack of depth. I mean, that was the biggest issue and that's why they lost the final two games. Just, you know, no, no Jordan Addison banged up Caleb Williams injuries on the offensive line injuries at defense. And it just, they just didn't have the pieces to, to continue that early season success where this year, as long as, they finish, fix some of the scheme deficiencies on defense and get that consistency about the offensive line, which we'll talk about tomorrow did look much improved. Um, you know, take it for what it is going against Nevada, but they did look improved, uh, you know, th but the depth is there. Yeah, they have all these, not just transfer death, but they have all these freshman recruits, this freshman class that is having an impact early on. And if they're not having an impact early on, they at least have them as depth pieces if necessary. So yeah, the future is bright for the men of Troy. That's perfect. Ryan, we'll get to get together tomorrow. I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Everybody enjoy your Labor Day. Uh, if you got, if you're barbecuing, be safe. I'm in construction, so we always say be safe. Make sure you keep the fire extinguisher close just in case you need it. 
<laughs> it's supposed to be six feet away or within yeah. arm reach, depending on the, how big the fire is. Always start from the bottom and work your way up. There you go. That's my safety Smokey, note for Smokey the Bear over here. Okay. <laughs> that's my safety. That's my safety note for the day. But Ryan, I appreciate your time, man. Everybody watching, I appreciate your time. This is the Bet Online Salute to Troy podcast for with another Victory Sunday. I want you guys to live free, fight on. We'll get see you guys later. Peace.